Thank you, Nady. Uh, so good to worship Jesus with you, 930 folks. Um, we get to follow Jesus together, and I love that. Uh, like Nady said, my name is Doug. Uh, you know, chances are um, all of us know someone in our friend circle or in our family, and they're the person who just tells it like it is, right? Uh, they just shoot straight with you. They don't care to be politically correct. They pull no punches. And uh, most of the time, we love them for that. But there's sometimes when they say something and we think, did that really just come out of their mouth, right? Anybody know someone like that? Um, if you've gotten elbows in the last few minutes, that's because your spouse thinks that's you, okay? Um, anyways, in my family growing up, our no-filter guy um, was always my brother. Stuff just came out of his mouth. There were countless times when I was just shocked. I was like, did I just hear you say what I think I heard you say? Uh, countless times I would look at my mom and dad's faces and they'd be like, did our son really just say that? Um, here's one time that was actually PG rated. Um, our family had a tradition where we would always pray before our dinner. So we were around the dinner table at home one night and my dad was saying the prayer. Hands clasped, eyes closed, all that sort of stuff. We're praying, it's calm, it's quiet. And then out of the blue, my brother just shouts, amen, hallelujah, praise Jesus, you know? And mom and dad and I, we were all like, what just happened? We were like jolted back out of our praying time. Um, but then we laughed, it was funny. Um, a few nights later, we were all out eating at a pretty nice restaurant, and we were doing the same thing. Dad was praying right before dinner, hands clasped, eyes closed, and then under the table, I felt this sudden thug up against my, thud up against my leg, and I'm like, what is that? Well, it was my brother trying to get my attention. I'd pick my head up and look at him, and he's making a face that clearly says, watch this. And then as my dad is praying in the middle of the restaurant, my brother shouts, Amen! Hallelujah! Praise Jesus! And mom and dad just go flush red in embarrassment. I'm like, he really did just do that. Oh my goodness. And my brother just raises his hand and points at himself to tell the whole restaurant, yeah, that was me. That just came out of my mouth. You just never knew what he was going to say. He always was going to shoot straight with you, didn't care to be politically correct. He would call a spade a spade, even to your face, if you didn't like it. And he would shout hallelujah if you were praying at dinner in a restaurant. Well, this morning we're in John's letter, 1 John in our Bible. And John also doesn't care to be politically correct, just so you know. John pulls no punches. He's going to shoot straight with us. And the words that are going to flow off of John's pen that we're going to read this morning will probably make all of us think, did he really just say that? And the answer is, yep. He did. John shoots straight with us. He tells it like it is when it comes to Jesus. He says that what we believe and what we do with Jesus determines everything else. For John, Jesus isn't a side hobby or an afterthought or just something we can look into if we feel like it. For John, Jesus isn't a once a week holy happy hour on Sunday mornings. No, for John, Jesus, what we do with him, what we believe about him determines everything else. And now here's the blunt part. <laughs> John says that what we believe and what we do with Jesus determines if we're an antichrist, a child of the devil, or a child of God. All right, I told you he's really blunt, so let's open our Bibles, do some study, and buckle in. We're going to start in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. It reads like this, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. Now, we better pause right there. John is talking about Antichrist. It's singular. And probably already in many of our minds, we're imagining this like epic end of world 
cosmic battle, you know, volcanoes erupting and earthquakes shaking, explosions galore, and these massive militaries marching against each other in battle, and right in the middle of it all is this superpower, world-ruling Thanos, dark lord, eyes of fire, big red horns, and we think that guy is the Antichrist, but don't think that way, okay? The Bible does talk about an antichrist, but whether that's a spirit of the age or a philosophy or a man of lawlessness, and how does all that come together from the different books of the Bible, that's not all super clear, actually. But what is super clear is what John says in the rest of verse 18. He continues and he writes, so as you've heard the antichrist is coming, so now many antichrists have come. John says, now, not like a distant cosmic future battle, but he's saying, now, for those readers in their time, in their place, in their space in the world, and he says, many antichrists have come, plural, okay? So many antichrists are already around them in that time. So, if John isn't talking about a future scary Halloween costume in an epic world battle, And John is talking about there's many antichrists already around them, already around us now. Then what is an antichrist? Am I? Are you an antichrist? Well, let's look at more of John's writings here in chapter 2 and see what he says. In verse 19, he says, They, these antichrists, they went out from us but were not of us. So these antichrists, they had like been in the churches, but then they had left the churches. Skip down to verse 22. He writes, who is the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. So John actually spells it out really plainly. An antichrist, antichrist, plural, are people who they were in the church, then they had left the church, and now they're lying back to these people, trying to deceive them, trying to tell them that Jesus isn't the Christ, that God the Father and God the Son, they're not legit, they're not worthy of our worship, okay? So that leads to a pretty big question. What does it mean to deny that Jesus is the Christ. I'll try to explain it like this. For thousands of years, God's people had been waiting for and longing for and looking for the Christ. Okay, and in the first two-thirds of our Bible, which is called the Old Testament, it has these statements and these promises about who the Christ will be. What will he be like? What will he do? What will be true of him? And a lot of those statements and promises can be summed up to say that the Christ is the Son of Man, which is just Bible language that means he is God come on earth. He is God and man on this earth, okay? And this God, man, man, God, he will come and save God's people and deliver them, okay? Now, this guy named Jesus comes on the historical scene. He lives his life. He dies on a cross. He resurrects from the dead, and he ascends back to heaven. And a whole host of people go, oh, Jesus is the Christ. And by the time that John is writing this letter that we're all studying this morning, a whole host of people from all different nations and tribes and tongues and languages, they had said, yeah, Jesus is the Christ. They believed, here comes the whiteboard, they believed that Jesus is both God and man. While he was on the earth, Jesus was God and man. And forever in heaven, God, Jesus will be both God and man. Now listen, he's not like, Half God and half man, part God, part man. No, the Bible teaches that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. This is what it means when they say Jesus is the Christ. We don't want to deny God the Father and God the Son. We want to worship God the Father and God the Son, okay? That's what they're talking about here. But then some people came along who couldn't just quite buy into the illogical sense of Jesus the Christ is both God and man. How does that really work? And so they developed their own explanations for this phenomenal historical figure named Jesus. One group was called the Docetist, okay? And they taught Docetism, all right? You're all getting like a college lecture here. You're welcome. Uh, It's totally free of charge and you get what you pay for. But 
docetism taught that Jesus, sure, Jesus was God, but he wasn't man. The Greek word dosa means to seem. So they basically said, Jesus' body, it was like a mirage. Like he was really God, but his body was just an image. It was a mirage. So was Jesus God? Yes. Was he man? No. Then another group came along and they said, yeah, we believe that Jesus was a man, but there's no way he could also be fully God. Right? They, they couldn't deny the fact that the dude had a heartbeat and a body and he lived and all that sort of stuff, but they couldn't quite come to grips with reality that this historical man was also fully God. We just can't buy that. Many of our Muslim friends and Buddhist friends and friends that follow different religions, even to this day, this is what they still believe about Jesus. What I want us to understand is both of these deny that Jesus is the Christ. Both of these deny that Jesus is fully God and fully man. The Bible teaches that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Why does all that matter? Why the college lecture this morning? Here's where it matters. What you believe about Jesus matters. What you think about Jesus, it matters. What we think, whenever we think of Jesus, it makes an eternal difference in our lives now and forever. Jesus and what we believe about him, what we think about him, it's not meant to be a side hobby or something we just look up in YouTube and see what wacky videos happen to show up that we can watch that day. No, what you believe about Jesus makes an eternal difference. Okay? And if, yeah, I'll keep going with this. So just watch this. If Jesus is God, but he is not man, then how can he truly connect with us? I mean, do you really want to follow a God who is distant and out there? And admittedly, he's powerful, but he never has known what it means, what it's like to actually be human to be weak, to be mad or glad or sad or hungry or thirsty. I don't want to follow a God like that who, yeah, he's powerful, but he doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand what it's like to live in this life. Furthermore, if Jesus is fully God, but he's not man, that means Jesus' death on the cross, it was fake. There's just an elaborate hoax to make it look like he really died on the cross, which therefore means your sin is still stuck on you. And my sin is still stuck on me, and I've lived long enough to learn that no matter how much I scrub away at that sin, it won't go away and stay away. If Jesus is God but not man, then Christianity crumbles. It falls apart. Similarly, if Jesus is fully man but not fully God, which is usually the more popular theory today, then how could he ever demand that we worship him? How could he ever demand that we obey him? If he's just man and not God and he calls us to worship him, then he's violating, he's breaking all sorts of laws in the Old Testament of the Bible and all the rest of his words might as well just be the words of a lunatic or a liar. If Jesus is only man but he's not fully God, then we've just got another moral example lined up next to Buddha and Gandhi and a host of other religious leaders who they maybe tried to be nice and say nice things but they're still in their graves. But if Jesus is both fully man and fully God, then we've got a winner. In City Light, that means we've got to worship him. Worship Jesus the Christ. It means that Jesus can fully identify with us, connect with us, and understand us, and he can command our worship and call us to follow him. It means that he can be both truly gracious and truly holy. He's someone we want to spend time with because he's our friend, and he's someone we better spend time with because he is God. City Light, what we believe about Jesus matters. I know this isn't politically correct, all right, but what I believe and what I say about Jesus makes the difference between me being an antichrist and me being a follower of Christ. Do you track with that? Okay, don't be an antichrist, all right? That's the first really blunt but truly biblical words on John's pen that we're reading this morning. Now, let's go to the end of our passage and get some more blunt words, right? Because we're just getting started. Go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And it reads like this. Whoever makes a practice of sinning 
is of the devil. I just wish John would like tell us what he really feels. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now skip down to verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Did you catch what he was saying there? Like John, he just called some people children of God. That's nice. But he also just called some people children of the devil. That's not nice. But it is real. It is real. And just like we love and appreciate those family members or those friends of ours who shoot straight and tell us like it is, I think if we'll actually slow down and listen to John, we'll end up thanking him as well. Now, when we hear that phrase, children of the devil, what comes to your mind? Like, in my mind, when I hear the phrase, I, I often imagine this old lady who's, like, really upset with the younger generation of kids these days and those phones that they're always on and they don't ever get off of them and they can't even hold down a job and those kids, they're so bad, they might as well be children of the devil. Or we might think of like some horror movie that we watched when we were younger and we can't get the images out of our head or we might think of heavy metal bands or whatever it is. But let's set those aside for now and come back and say, John, let's ask him, what does he mean when he says children of the devil? Well, according to verse 8 and verse 10 that I just read earlier, John says children of the devil are people who make a practice of sinning and they don't make a practice of of righteousness. So just know, John's not calling for perfection here, okay? He's not saying, hey man, if you slip up and sin this week, then all of a sudden you're back to being a child of the devil. No, what he's saying, he's calling for developing habits, for intentionally and de um, deliberately practicing righteousness, and intentionally and deliberately rejecting the practice of sin, for us to change and become more like Jesus in our lives. Now, when I was in middle school, I developed a practice of foul language, okay? I didn't do it much, only did it whenever I was around the other athletes in the locker room, but I would practice saying those words, and I would practice when to say those words so that it sounded like them and those guys who I kind of thought were cool might think I was kind of cool. It was a practice of mine. A little bit later, God highlighted this practice to me, and I felt a conviction of sin, and I knew that I needed to repent to change my practice. And so then I had to practice saying different words. I had to practice watching my mouth and saying different words instead of the foul words. Just like the sport itself, the change was a practice. And just like learning an instrument or singing or developing a craft or a trade or learning how to drive a car, following Jesus, it takes practice. And John is calling for us to practice righteousness, deliberately and intentionally following Jesus and making changes in your life to become more like Jesus and to reject the practice of sinning. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this, what am I practicing? Are you practicing sin, developing habits of laziness and lewdness and sexual sin or addictions or you're harboring and feeding anger and bitterness in your bones? Are you practicing sin or are you practicing righteousness, developing habits of holy words and wise decisions in your life, deep delight in your soul, Bible reading, Bible listening, praying, spending time with Jesus' community and friends who can help us practice righteousness. Do you see the difference between practicing sin and practicing righteousness? John is clearly calling for us to reject the practice of sin and embrace the practice of righteousness. We don't want to be children of the devil. You tracking with that too? That's the second very blunt but truly biblical thing that John tells us. Okay, now so far the message this morning has been like a heads up, warning and watch out sort of message. But I want to close this morning looking at this beautiful truth that John sandwiches in our passage. 
He's talked about antichrist and he's talked about children of the devil. But sandwiched right in between those, he tells us, he gives this sweet assurance to children of God. Sweet assurance for children of God. So, so you're like, here's slow your heart rate a little bit, take a deep breath, and hear these words. We're going to pick them up in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, and we'll read through chapter 3, verse 1. Just hear these words. And now, little children, abide in him. Remain in Jesus, he's saying, so that when he appears, we may have confidence. We may have courage and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Oh, that is good news. Sandwich right in between these warnings and these heads up that we're in a battle. John gives us some sweet assurance. I, I, I just want to read chapter 3, verse 1. I need to hear it again. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. He gives it. We don't have to earn it. That we should be called, identified, known by God as children of God. And so we are. Now listen. If you reject that Jesus is the Christ, if, if you reject that Jesus is both God and man, fully God, fully man, and you do not worship Jesus Christ, then this sweet assurance isn't for you. And if you make deliberate and intentional practice of sin, you regularly push away the kindness of Jesus, the grace of Jesus to call you to himself, and you continue practicing sin instead of turning and practicing righteousness, I don't like to say this, but this sweet assurance isn't for you. But if you embrace Jesus as the Christ, as the God-man who came and he lived a perfect life in your place and he died on the cross for you and he rose again to give you power to live for him. If you embrace Jesus Christ and worship Jesus Christ, then these words of assurance, they are specifically designed for your soul in those moments of doubt and discouragement. And if that embrace of Jesus as Christ, the God-man, if it's led to real changes in your life where you're not perfect, but you're becoming more and more like Jesus, then these sweet words of assurance, they are specifically designed for your soul to assure you of the Father's love when you slip up or you mess up and you sin again and you wish that you hadn't. These words are designed to give you sweet assurance. John understands that following Jesus isn't easy. Studying and really knowing what we believe about Jesus, it takes work. And practicing righteousness, pursuing God with holy habits, it takes work. And John knows we need assurance in that. Assurance that the Father loves us. Assurance that we're his kids, his children, his chosen ones. Assurance that he's not mad at us or angry or just waiting to bring the hammer down on us. But because of Jesus the Christ, he is our father who loves us and he's made us his children. In this intense battle where the antichrist of culture are lying to us about Jesus and trying to lead us astray from him. In this intense battle with ourselves where we're tempted to just sin and live for ourselves. John knows we need assurance, this deep confidence that we are loved by God the Father and we're his children. And let me close with an illustration that might help bring this to life a little bit for us. Imagine you're younger and you're in a baseball game, okay? It's the late innings, the score is tied, there's runners on base, and you're the one who's up next to bat, okay? And you've been practicing all season long. You've been working hard. It's been an exhausting game, and it feels like it's all led up to this. Your dad just so happens to be the coach of your team. 
And so you've been out in the backyard all season long learning how to throw harder and catch better. You and your dad would go to the baseball diamond and take batting practice. And it hasn't been a perfect season, but I mean, you've been trying hard. It hasn't been your best season, but you're in it and you're trying. You've been spending time with your father. You've been spending time practicing. And now here you are in this intense moment, the heat of the battle, the scores tied, runners on base, late innings, and you're the one at the plate. It feels like everything's up to you. The pitcher, man, he looks huge out there on the mound, taller than you, and the opponents and the crowd and your teammates, they're all yelling and screaming, and everything seems so loud, and here you are at the plate. Now, freeze frame that right there. Stay stuck in that moment. Where do you want to look for assurance in that moment? Where do you want to look like for a sense of confidence to step into that batter's box? What do you want to see that will help you step into that intense battle and do your best? You could look out at the scoreboard, right? But like, that's not going to help you much other than to remind you just how intense this moment is. That is the late innings and it's a tie ball game and there's runners on base and look, you're the one at the plate. It's all up to you. You could look at the, opponent, uh, the opponents, right? But all they're going to do is look back at you with sneers and trying to make you feel terrible. And they're just hoping for the worst for you, that you'll swing and a miss and walk back to the dugout in shame. You might look at your own track record earlier in that season and go, well, you know, there's been times when I was at the plate and I got a hit. But you'll also remember all those times you were at the plate and you struck out or popped out or flied out or ground out or all the other kinds of outs that there are in baseball. You may not want to look at that when you're in the heat of the battle, that intense moment, where do you want to look for a sense of confidence and courage? My suggestion, my belief, is that every child, when they're in a moment like that, they want to be able to look at their dad. And when they look to their dad, they want to see something in his eyes. They want to see eyes of love. Eyes that communicate, child, I love you no matter what. Man, if you strike out, I still love you. If you swing for the fences and hit a home run, I love you. No matter how this goes, I love you, and you are still my child. Nothing can change my love for you. And it's those eyes of love, that assurance of love from your father that compels you to want to do well. Those eyes of love, they remind you that before you're the ball player at the plate, before you're in the middle of this stressful, intense situation, before you're a student at school, before you're anything else, you are his child, his beloved, his delight and his joy. And that love that you see in your dad's eyes gives you the courage to step into that batter's box and do your best. That love that you see in your father's eyes is what compels you to give it everything you've got. And I think that's what John is tapping into. I think that's what John is getting at when he assures us of the father's love. Right in the middle of reminding us that we're in, the, in an intense battle, right? An intense battle for truth where there's antichrist in a culture that's lying to us and trying to get us to believe the wrong things about Jesus. Right in the middle of an intense battle with our own sin and our own flesh where we're tempted to do things our own way and live our own way and just live for ourselves. And right in the middle of the battle, in the late innings of the game, in the last hour, John assures us, hear me, you are children of God. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. John pulls no punches. John shoots straight. He tells us it's intense, but he also gives us assurance that we are the children of God. If you want to know if the Father truly loves us, if you want to know if the Father truly loves you, then look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ, the God-man, died for us. This is the death of Jesus that shows the Father's love to us. And his death was real. It wasn't fake. It was real and we can put our full confidence in him. 
His death is powerful, powerful enough to give us the power to practice righteousness in our lives. And his death is beautiful. It shows us the love of the Father for us. And so even now, would you pray with me and let's ask God to give us eyes to see the love of the Father. Oh God, we're praying right now. We're asking that you would be speaking to us. Would you open the eyes of our heart to see your love, to behold that we are children of God, that the cross of Jesus Christ is enough to wash away our sins and make us white as snow. The cross of Jesus Christ is enough to take away our sins and make us your child adopted into your family, fully safe, fully secure because of Jesus and all he accomplished for us. Would you help us to see that? Would you help us to know that and believe that? Right now I pray for any friends in the room who they just need to be reassured of your fatherly love for them. Oh, Holy Spirit, just like Romans 5, verse 5 says, oh, Spirit, would you pour the Father's love into our hearts so that we have no need to be ashamed. We can have full confidence because, Spirit of God, you're pouring the Father's love into our hearts. I pray that the words of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 would be alive in us not just a theological truth that was once written down, but the air we breathe, what we taste, what we live in. Father, I'd be remiss. I want to also pray for anybody in the room who they're struggling with, what do they believe about Jesus? And I just pray that they would take time this week, set aside some time, and they'd write down, pen and paper or notes app on their phone, they'd actually write down what they believe about Jesus that it wouldn't just be an afterthought or something they'll get to down the road, but they take it seriously and realize that what they believe matters. And as they write that down, oh God, if there's any question marks, if there's just a big blank and they're not for sure what they believe, then I pray you would give them the, the courage to share that with their city group, to process it with a pastor, to email Eric or Nick or myself and say, man, can we talk? I need to understand better, who is Jesus? What do I believe about Jesus? And Father, I also pray for anyone who might be making a practice of sin. And they're intentionally, deliberately nurturing sin in their lives. Oh, Jesus, call them to repentance. Would you show them the death and destruction that comes with sin and show them the life and liberty that comes with following you? And then, Jesus, would you give us the sweet assurance that we are children of the Father, paid for by your blood and adopted into his family. What a good gift. Let us know it. Let us taste it. We pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. Oh, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen 